In all of the examples of Hamilton's principle so far, we've taken the variation of the integral of the Lagrangian set it equal to zero. We haven't taken advantage of the fact that we may know the general form of the Euler equation for Hamilton's principle. So in this section, we're going to determine what that is. We're, we'll call it the Euler-Lagrange equation. It is just the Euler equations from chapter two, but applied specifically to Hamilton's principle, we'll refer to it as the Euler-Lagrange equation. In the examples that we've done so far using Hamilton's principle, both for discrete and continuous systems, if you think about the dependent variables that we had, the degrees of freedom, we've had positions, they could be angles, they could be displacements. So we'd like to have something, we'll call them generalized coordinates, that are just placeholders for these dependent variables. And what we're gonna get are the Euler-Lagrange equations that I just described. We can use the Euler-Lagrange equations directly, not have to take the variation of the integral of the Lagrangian and set it equal to zero. We're gonna focus here on the discrete case, not the continuous case, just to keep our discussion focused. The notation we're gonna use is, is that generalized coordinates, those are the dependent variables, will be Q. So Q1 through Qn. So if it's one dimensional, then just Q. If it's two dimensional, Q1 and Q2, n dimensional, Q1 through Qn of t. All of these are the dependent variables. They're functions of t. Once again, they could be positions, they could be angles, whatever the dependent variables are for our particular situation. Generalized velocities are then simply time derivatives of the generalized coordinates. As you'll see in a moment, generalized velocities are not always true actual velocities. We'll see when they are and when they aren't, so just be careful about that. In addition to our generalized coordinates and generalized velocities, we then have a virtual displacement corresponding to each of those. So for Q1 through Qn, we have a delta Q1 through delta Qn. These, again, are the virtual displacements. They're possible displacements in the directions that the system could go, whether it does or not. To introduce how these generalized coordinates are used, let's look at Cartesian coordinates first, and then we'll look at cylindrical coordinates as well. So in Cartesian coordinates, let's imagine we have a single particle, capital N is equal to one, and it can move in all three directions, so little n is three. So then our position vector r is xi plus yj plus zk, and those are our dependent variables as a function of time. So then q1 is x, q2 is y, and q3 is, is z. So we could write our position vector in terms of the generalized coordinates as q1i plus q2j plus q3k. The velocity vector is the time rate of change of the position vector, so that's r dot. So that's x dot i plus y dot j plus z dot k, q1 dot i plus q2 dot j plus q3 dot k. And what you'll notice here is that the actual velocity components, x dot y dot and z dot, and the generalized velocities, q1 dot q2 dot q3 dot, are now the same. Now the reason why I say that is because while that's true in Cartesian coordinates, that will not be true in cylindrical coordinates, as you'll see in a moment. So then, for example, if you form the kinetic energy, one half mv squared, v squared is just r dot dotted with r dot. You take the dot product of r dot with itself, and you get x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared, which of course you can simply write in terms of the q123 instead of the x, y, z. Now let's look at cylindrical coordinates. In cylindrical coordinates, the position vector, r, as a function of t, is just r e r plus z e z. You actually don't need the theta component. If you have r and z, that tells you exactly where you are in three-dimensional cylindrical coordinates. But the generalized velocities are q1 is r, q2 is theta, and q3 is z, the three coordinates of cylindrical coordinates. And now what's gonna happen is that the actual velocity components and the generalized velocities will not all be the same in the context of cylindrical coordinates as they were in Cartesian coordinates. So let's first write down the generalized velocity. Generalized velocity is simply the time rate of change of each of the generalized coordinates. So q1 dot er, q2 dot e theta, and q3 dot e z. So that's just r dot, theta dot, and z dot. The actual velocity, however, is not the same. The actual velocity is vr er plus v theta e theta plus vz ez. vr is just r dot, vz is just z dot, but v theta, so the actual velocity is r times theta dot, the radial distance times the angular velocity theta dot. So now in terms of generalized coordinates, the actual velocity, not the generalized velocity, but the actual velocity is q1 dot er, plus q1 times q2 dot e theta plus q3 dot e z. 
So you can see that the actual and the generalized velocities are not the same in the context of cylindrical coordinates. So just be careful about that. So for example, for kinetic energy, T is 1 half mv squared. So v squared, that's vr squared plus v theta squared plus vz squared. But v theta is r theta dot. So again, in terms of generalized coordinates, that's the expression for the kinetic energy in cylindrical coordinates. So once again, notice that our generalized coordinates, they could be distances such as r and z, they could be angles such as theta, they may have different units and, and so on. So the generalized velocities are simply, again, the time derivatives of the generalized coordinates. They are not necessarily velocities. They don't even necessarily have the same units as a velocity. All right, so how does this help us get a general Euler-Lagrange equation for Hamilton's principle? Normally you think, well, the kinetic energy, that's 1 half mv squared. So it depends on velocities. So it depends on the q dots. But we just saw that in cylindrical coordinates, it could also depend on q's. So those are generalized coordinates. So it could depend on both generalized coordinates as well as generalized velocities. The potential energy, on the other hand, only depends on the positions, the generalized coordinates, the q's. So we're going to use that now to get the general Euler-Lagrange equations. So let's go back to Hamilton's principle. Now this is Hamilton's principle for discrete conservative systems. So that's the variation of the integral of L, which is t minus v, must be equal to zero. Now the integrand, capital F, which is now just the Lagrangian, is a function of the independent variable time, as well as all of the dependent variables q, q1 through qn, as well as the derivatives with respect to time of the q1 through qn. Now the kinetic energy could be a function of t, qi, and qi dot, whereas the potential energy v is only a function of t and qi, not qi dot. So then when we apply the general form of the Euler equation from chapter two to this particular type of functional, we just have partial f partial qi minus ddt of partial f partial qi dot is equal to zero. So this is the simplest form that we had in chapter two, but instead of u, our dependent variables are now the qi's, and our independent variable rather than x is now t. But otherwise, this is just a functional with an integrand that's a function of the independent variable, the dependent variables, and the derivatives of the dependent variables. So that's the general form of the Euler equation. So in our case, f is just L, the Lagrangian. So we have this as our Euler equation. There are as many Euler equations as there are dependent variables, and there are as many dependent variables as there are degrees of freedom of the system. And again, L is simply T minus V, the kinetic minus the potential energy, which forms a Lagrangian. Now, because there are N of these equations, we'll get N, again, corresponding to the number of degrees of freedom, coupled ordinary differential equations for Q1 of T, Q2 of T through Qn of T. And that's completely consistent with what we saw in chapter two. So to make it abundantly clear how this relates to what we did in chapter two, let's take a look at the chapter two notation versus Hamilton's principal notation. So the independent variable was X, it's now T. The dependent variable or variables were U, and now those are the QI. The integrand was capital F of X U U prime, it's now capital L of T Q I Q I dot. And then the Euler equations, they were partial F partial U minus DDX of partial F partial U prime is equal to zero. And now it's the same thing where F has become L, X has become T, and U has become Q I and Q I dot. Now if you're paying attention closely, you'll notice that the form of the Hamilton's principle that we've used so far in getting these Euler-Lagrange equations was for conservative forces. If we have non-conservative forces, we have the same left-hand side, but then we have minus capital Q sub I on the right-hand side. Q sub I, those are the generalized forces that come from non-conservative forces. They're generalized forces, they may not have the units of force, but they come from the action of the non-conservative forces on the system. And then Lagrangian L T minus V, that V only incorporates the effects of the conservative forces in the potential energy V that go into the L. Any non-conservative forces have to be included here. There's more information in the book on this if you're interested.